My great pleasure to introduce today's program, The U.S. Role in Security in Northeast Asia, Is There a Solution to the North Korea Problem, with Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, President and CEO of the Korea Economic Institute. She served as Ambassador to the Republic of Korea from 2008 to 2011. Jim Thompson will be moderating today's program. He is President Emeritus of the RAND Corporation and is a member of the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council. For those of you who want to ask questions, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can type in your questions. Uh, Rachel Kenderdine will manage those questions in about 35 minutes during the Q&A portion. And with that, let me please bring on Ambassador Stevens and Jim Thompson to begin this very timely program. Okay. So far, so good, I guess. We couldn't hear you at first, Kim, but I guess we're we're okay now. My so, apologies. Well, you I want, to... Yeah. <laughs> I want to welcome uh, Ambassador Kathleen Stevens to the LA World Affairs Council. Uh, of course, she's been in LA plenty of times, but today is virtually. She'll be here again next week. But but uh, Kathy is, is a, a retired foreign service officer. I'm not sure you ever really retired foreign service <laughs> officer. But she had a career in the Foreign Service dealing with both uh, East Asia and with Europe. <clears throat> it was, I was surprised to read that one of her languages is Serbo-Croatian. So that's... Um, that counts uh, as two languages now. <laughs> oh, does it? <laughs> so in any case, we, it, you know, much of her career, however, has revolved around East Asia and Korea. And she was the, as, as Kim mentioned, was the ambassador to Korea for three years from 2008 to 2011. She's currently the president and chief executive of the Korea Economic Institute, but she's involved in many other organizations uh, involved in, in international relations and security, such as the Korea, uh, Korea Society and the Pacific Century Institute, where I'm proud to serve. She's the chairman of the board of that, and I'm proud to be her vice chair. So, um, Kathy, so we're so glad to have you here. You know, it might be good to start for our audience telling how how did how did you get involved in Korea in the first place, and how did you come to be the ambassador? <laughs> well, uh, the latter question, how did I become to be that? Is a long and winding road, and you don't want to hear all of that. But um, I, uh, I I grew up in the Southwest in Arizona. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is the first ocean I ever put my toe into, and it was somewhere south of Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, I had a great professor in college who got me interested in Asia and China. This is the 1970s, so I have to date myself here when the Vietnam War was a big issue. Uh, Nixon was going to China. We didn't have diplomatic relations with China at that time. And I had the chance when I was 19 years old to go to Hong Kong and study for a year at the University of Hong Kong. And that you know, that, that, that's what started it. Uh, after I finished my undergrad, I thought, well, I could go into debt and go to graduate school, or I could get some more experience on the ground, if you like, and I, I applied to the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps suggested I go to Korea. And at that time, Korea was not the cool place it is today, or wasn't regarded that way, but I went to Korea, and that was a transformative experience. Learned a little Korean, so learning a language is an important part of it. And so I had a long foreign service career after that with uh, some service in China and Korea. But somehow, somewhere, mostly I reminded Condi Rice uh, uh, when she was Secretary of State in 2007, 2008, that once upon a time I, I lived in Korea and spoken some Korean. I was working on some issues related to North Korea. And I had the great good fortune to be nominated to be ambassador to Korea. So uh, good things come to those who wait a very long time sometimes, but uh, I've spent about 11 years in Korea uh, overall living there. So it was great to go back as ambassador. You're muted, Jim, I think. Yeah, no. I got it. Yeah, I got it. It's a, we're working with some feedback problems. Yeah. So um, you know, also it would be, I think for our, for our audience to say a little bit about your current post. What is the Korean Economic Institute? What does it do? What's its mission? What can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, uh, we're here in Washington, D.C. That's the, you're seeing my background here. There's a little jackhammer nose, noise, too. So there's some work going on on the roads, the potholes. Maybe that's the infrastructure plan. Uh, but uh, it's been around for about 40 years. Uh, and basically, it's a small public policy institute that's dedicated to trying to uh, create a, a platform and contribute to a conversation, greater understanding of Korea, both North and South, but particularly South Korea, in the United States, and you know, way back when it started in the 1980s, people didn't know that much about South Korea, or it was a very different place. Uh, and uh, over the years, we've uh, uh, built a lot of programs, including with the World Affairs Council. So thank you, Jim, for your work, both with the LA World Affairs Council and also uh, nationwide. We send uh, 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 small panels uh, all around the country if it, of uh, Korean diplomats, American diplomats, others to talk about issues in the relationship. And of course, people are so interested. Well, North Korea is a perennial. I'm sure we'll get it to today. But there's a lot of topics related to South Korea, too, from trade and investment to, you know, the latest on Netflix to a lot more. And so we uh, we try to uh, uh, stimulate that that conversation. And it's, it's a great time to do it. It's tempting to switch over and talk a little bit about the phenomenon of the Korean uh, soft soft power and, the, and its role in the world. But I guess we're here to talk about security. So maybe if there's time, we can go back to that. But let's. this has been a quite a time in the world this last year, starting with the invasion of Ukraine. And um, but also we've had going on in addition to that, the, the deterioration of the US-China relation in, in in that part of the world, we've also had continuing a saber rattling and nuclear uh, missile tests by the North Koreans. A, a lot is going on in East Asia as well as in Europe. And I think for me, the most striking piece of news in the last couple of months has been the announcement from the Japanese prime minister that Japan is going to change its security policy increase its defense budget by uh, basically a factor of two, going from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP, and and uh, acquiring a counter-strike capability, which suggests the ability to perhaps even strike at China mm -hmm. in the event of, of tensions. I'm just, uh, it. this took me by surprise. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it shouldn't have been if I'd been more closely uh, watching this more closely, but what can you tell us about this change in Japan and, and you know, what, what's the implications for the security of that part of the world? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you've summarized, I mean, both what an extraordinary and, and really difficult year where I think we're still in, or now a couple of years in terms of the security and geopolitical situation in the region and the world, but also with respect to how people, how countries are responding to it. Um, Prime Minister Kishida was in Washington just a month or so ago, and uh, this is when some of these announcements came out uh, about, about the increase. It's, a, it's an increase in defense spending that will uh, take place over uh, five years. Uh, it's uh, since we're talking about going, as you said, from about 1% of GDP to about 2%, which is still lower than NATO allies, lower than, than South Korea. But a big jump for Japan, which, of course, since World War II has under its you know, so-called pacifist constitution uh, only had, again, kind of so-called defense for self-defense forces and has relied for most of its security on on the United States. So I think this reflects several things. I mean, one is the United States actually under successive administrations uh, uh, going back uh, to uh, uh, Bush II and, and Obama and, and, and through the recent administrations to the Biden administration have wanted to see uh, uh, Japan take a larger role. Uh, successive Japanese leaders have wanted the same. Uh, the former uh, prime minister assassinated uh, Mr. Abe had pushed this uh, along. And I think in the aftermath, to get to why it's happening now, I think in the aftermath of his death, his assassination, uh, Mr. Kishida coming to office, uh, Mr. Biden, President Biden's uh, focus on really strengthening alliance relations in the context, of course, of a more assertive and aggressive China. Uh, but also, uh, and you've, I, I think Ukraine has played a, a, a larger role than sometimes people who focus only on Asia take into account. I think that the uh, uh, Putin's invasion, Putin's attack 
on uh, Ukraine came as a big shock to the Japanese body politic, that maybe it really was time, you know, in addition to the concerns about China, in addition actually to the concerns about the reliability of the United States. Um, then came Putin's act, and I think there was a sense that the Japanese public was going to be more accepting. Uh, they've, they've tended to be pretty uh, uh, cautious about moving away from the post-war order, which had served them pretty well. So I think all these things have contributed to the Japanese moving in this direction. Now, I think it's still, it's dramatic, it's important, it's relatively gradual. So I wouldn't, you know, want to consider to sort of characterize this as kind of the, the militarization or remilitarization, but it's a sense that it's a changing world out there and the Japanese are going to play a larger, and if you like, as, as, as Prime Minister Abe used to say, uh, the role of more of a normal country, uh, commiserate with its economic, uh, its soft power, its, its geopolitical situation. Is it is it fair to say, Kathy, that this is in a sense, also, uh, it's not a big departure in the in the sense that it, this Japan continues to view its security as tied closely to the United States, and so it's not a departure to say we need to do something for ourselves separate from the U.S. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, uh, uh, the the Trump years were uh, were disconcerting for our allies because uh, there was a, a and I still get a lot of questions. I uh, whether it's in Korea or Japan or elsewhere about whether or not the United States is turning more more definitively towards a, a, a more isolationist, for lack of a better word, but uh, moving away from kind of the alliance relationships. President Biden has obviously tried to underscore us at the importance of of alliances, but absolutely the. Japanese that think they need to both strengthen that alliance as much as possible, but also ensure that they have their own capabilities to be uh, to be to be full full partners uh, in it. And you know, within this, I mean, it's important to remind people that I mean, the U.S. has uh, large forces in Japan. Uh, that was that's also part of the post World War II order and very much related to the Korean War, which of course happened right after the Second World War. Uh, we have, you know, over 100,000 troops. I should have the clearer number, but so it's a it's a it's a large number, and also some of the changes that don't come so much with the defense budget numbers we hear, but are important in terms of Japan's intentions. Are um, the United States and Japan are are coming up with ways of coordinating more closely together in terms of some of their command and control. So it's both more more integrated as well as more of, if you like, an independent capability and, and contributing more, both in terms of budget and manpower to it. So um, how does this also, I mean, the relationship between uh, Seoul and Tokyo has been a scratchy one for quite a long time. And um, do, do you think that this, this particular step or will be something different can get that relationship back onto a good track? I, I think it ha has to be handled very carefully. Um, yeah, certainly, as I'm sure just about everybody listening today is probably aware, Japan and Korea have a, 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 a difficult history uh, going back to, of course, before the Second World War when Japan uh, in its effort to imitate, uh, I guess, the Western powers, it would say, uh, decided that Korea was going to be its first imperial colony. Uh, that didn't go so well, and uh, and there's still a lot of historical baggage from a very, very tragic part of, of, of history in, in both countries, and certainly in Korea. Uh, the new Yoon government in Seoul is determined to uh, kind of put a floor on the relationship, and I think they have after it. It has been very fraught in recent years. The two countries do have very important economic ties, of course, and I think that there is, uh, you know, more space than people sometimes see, and it will increase to work together on security issues. Certainly, that's something that, again, successive American administrations have have encouraged and will continue to do. And I think there's some room for it. I would say it was interesting, uh, you know, uh, as much as I can I can judge it sitting here in Washington, the South Korean response to these announcements that you you laid out about the increase in Japanese uh, military spending and so on. Um, have been commented on in what's a very, very free and vibrant press in South Korea and a very politically polarized environment, but it's been commented on, I think, with some thoughtfulness and restraint. You know, there, ha there hasn't been a sort of a, a lot of uh, 
kind of extreme or panicky statements about Japan's about to, you know, return to uh, 19, the 1930s or something. So I think there's also because these two countries do share a lot and not just being allies of the United States, but South Korea and Japan, I mean, in terms of their economies, in terms of their concerns about China, in terms of, of their cultures in many ways and their soft power, you know, they, uh, th there's a lot where they can work together. So I, 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 I am, you know, always concerned, but a, a little more hopeful now that um, things are going to get a little bit better uh, between the two. I mean, until, of course, somebody says something that sets off another controversy, but that's the direction I think everybody would like to see it go in. Well, I was just thinking about the fact that they got a muted response in, in Korea. Well, of course, we'll come to this a little bit later, but of course, the Japanese prime minister didn't say, maybe we need to get our own nuclear weapons. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, right. Which would have, I think, had a somewhat different reaction in, in Korea. So, um, so yeah. we now we now have a uh, uh, you know the relationship between the U.S. and China is uh, you know pretty much in in the pits, and I think it hasn't been helped, of course, by this balloon story, uh, which I don't think either you or I are going to be able to provide the details about the balloon that will satisfy any questioners, although we invite people to ask if they want. Um, the, the, um, but the U.S., of course, knows it can't, it can't confront China alone, and it also knows it can't defend Taiwan alone, if, if, because, and of course, the pressure has been growing on Taiwan, and we're likely to have another visit by the Speaker of the House to Taiwan in the spring, because it would with the new speaker has apparently already made it clear he's planning to go to Taiwan, which is liable to bring about another set of reactions from the Chinese. So where do our two our two staunch allies in 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 the region, Japan and South Korea, stand with respect to the US strategy toward Korea and, and the defense of Taiwan? Yeah. Um, well, first, maybe let me say just a word. I'm not trying to say much about the balloons. You say I'm just reading the papers, too, but about U.S.-China relations. I mean, I, I would, you know, yeah, characterize U.S.-China relations that you have as, as being uh, quite bad. I mean, they already were, uh, I think, ratcheting in a you know, pretty negative direction uh, when I think President Biden and President Xi had their face-to-face -face meeting for, for the first time in those roles uh, in Bali just a few months ago. And there, the, I think the intent really was, and they said to kind of put a floor on the relationship, that there is concern that the, the, the things were escalating too much. And the plan for Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, to go to Beijing, it would have been, I guess, last week, was to try to, again, try to find a little bit of a way to establish some kind of communication, because I think there was a sense that things were spiraling pretty pretty badly in the other direction. Of course, in China, you've also, I mean, Xi has had his challenges, I mean, notwithstanding his re-election as kind of leader for, if not for life, for, for another term, uh, maybe for life. Um, you know, the uh, the kind of huge switch from almost total lockdown to no COVID restrictions. And, you know, he's got a lot on his plate, let's just put it that way. So with all that, I think there was some reasons on both sides to, to see if uh, we could move things forward in a modest way. And I do think it was, it was interesting uh, last night and President Biden in his State of the Union speech, which did not say much about foreign policy at all, um, uh, was also pretty restrained on China. He talked about competition, not conflict. Uh, and uh, and then competition, meaning all the areas, including in domestic areas where the United States needs to do more and better, and also again and again about allies. So right. So to your question, where do our allies stand on Taiwan? Uh, well, again, I think our allies, like us, are concerned that uh, Xi Jinping may, you know, think that if not now, when? In terms of you know the longstanding uh, stated goal of the. People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party, to reunite uh, Taiwan uh, with the mainland. And, you know, on the one hand, uh, there's speculation. We don't know that maybe she has, you know, seen what uh, the, the, the fierce resistance that the Ukraine and for that and the Ukraine and the world has put up to Putin's aggression and, and made them think twice about Taiwan. I certainly hope so. Uh, that uh, this, uh, this, this alliance uh, uh, strengthening that we're seeing will also give them pause. But I would, you know, Japan and Korea, what I would say about it is 
both Japan and Korea, like the United States, have become more, you know, in their rhetoric, a little more outspoken about, about the importance they attach to stability and peace in the Taiwan Straits and in Taiwan. And, you know, they used to, especially South Korea, not say anything about it at all. Now it's a feature of statements. Now it's, but in terms of what would they do in the, I mean, you know, hard to even fathom sort of scenario of an actual war uh, uh, and, and, and an attack by China to retake Taiwan. You know, the U.S. has long had a policy that was called strategic ambiguity, and President Biden has been a little bit less ambiguous in his own public statements in terms of suggesting that the U.S. would defend uh, uh, Taiwan. But in fact, we don't have a security treaty with Taiwan. We provide them with um, uh, the arms and, and support that, that they need, and there's going to be a lot more of that going in, I think. But, you know, our, our policy is also we want to see peace. Uh, we agree in principle with the notion that there's only one China, but that we think reunification has to be peaceful um, and, and according to certain values. So I think that China, uh, that both Japan and, and, and Korea are worried as we are and are trying to line up with the United States as they pursue more or less where we are, but how they would participate and what that would look like, I think is still pretty open to question. And for South Korea, sorry for this long answer, they also have an added worry is they always think, look, our major security problem is still, notwithstanding everything else, is still North Korea. Uh, and moreover, again, in this horrible sort of scenario of war breaking out in the Taiwan Straits, would North Korea see that as an opportunity to make some mischief in their neighborhood? So everyone's thinking about it and uh, deepening their conversation about it, I think, through a lot of channels, both security, diplomatic, and other. Good. Let's. Well, that's. I was interested. I was thinking of adding some more, but I think we need to get North Korea, which you've now kind of. <laughs> Sorry, I think my answer is too long. <laughs> to I think it's. Um, of course, the North Koreans have been busy in the last year testing missiles, uh, and I think they've now demonstrated the ability to to basically put the all their adversaries in range, if they want to. Whether they can put a nuclear weapon that far, I don't know, but. As one of my friends has said, the key thing is they have the nuclear weapons, and we delivering it is another is the next step to worry about. Not so much, but they have them. And um, meanwhile, though, on the diplomatic front, the, the 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 negotiations, to the extent there were any before, have gone completely silent. The Biden administration is not saying much about these missile tests. And um, they seem to have gone silent. Do you have a what is what is a what is the U.S. policy now toward North Korea? Do you have a re a reading on that? Well, yeah, I think I wouldn't say exactly they've gone silent. I mean, uh, on the one hand, and this is one one thing that South Koreans often say, clearly there's a lot of other things going on in the world. And and again, it was notable. I mentioned the, the State of the Union. I mean, it really only mentioned. Ukraine and China and kind of Russia, you know, the rest of the world wasn't there. No, no mention of North Korea or elsewhere. But, uh, uh, but you know, if you look at the Biden administration, I mean, as they came in, the diplomacy had kind of ended, if you like, with a you know rather dramatic fashion when with the the meltdown at, in Hanoi uh, of the meeting between the second meeting or third meeting, whatever it was, the second meeting between uh, then President Trump and Kim Jong Un, when you know. Uh, deal or no deal, it was no deal, uh, and uh, and that pretty much ended diplomacy uh, for that. But in, in the in the first part of the Biden administration, I think still pretty quiet, kind of COVID, and then as you say, over this last, past year, I think what we see from the North Korean leadership from Kim Jong Un is his having you know made a decision. I mean, he said that North Korea's goal right now is to establish itself in a undisputed way, or at least he'd like it to be undisputed, as a nuclear weapons state with the ability to deliver these weapons of mass destruction uh, via a sophisticated range of missiles, you know, not on the scale of other powers, but, but a bit sizable one nonetheless. And that is what he has been focused on. Um, the Biden administration did do a review of its North Korea policy when it came in. It didn't publish a lot of details, but the, 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 the outlines are pretty clear. And one is, the response to the missile testing, 
uh, as you say, there's there's uh, expectations that at any point the North Koreans would might do another nuclear test. Perhaps the Chinese have restrained them somewhat. We don't know, but they've already done six since since 2006. Uh, that what the, what what the administration has done is again working with allies and partners, as they say, like a refrain. A lot of military exercises. Uh, a lot of, I don't think they call them shows of force, but essentially show, shows of capability. I think that's the way that they are responding. They're not responding so much rhetorically. I mean, remember that we really don't have the option, which we used to have, of going to the UN Security Council uh, and getting some kind of condemnation of the North Koreans when they fire off a missile because we're kind of back to the Cold War days and China and Russia are not going to are not going to cooperate. I mean, it would take something really, really new for the North Koreans. And I say, even then, who knows, given where we are. So I think I think Kim Jong-un feels he has some space now to develop this program. And I think the Biden administration has said, and I take him at their word, they're ready to talk. But they're ready to talk on the basis that eventually North Korea is going to give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, the North Koreans have shown no interest in talking on that basis, or for that matter, really any other basis that they see coming out of the Biden administration now. So you're right, it's pretty much at a, as I'd say, in terms of, of, of diplomacy with North Korea, uh, the lowest point has been a long time. Yeah, so meanwhile, I think given, given that, I mean, we have to be we have to be focused on our own deterrent capabilities to make sure that we've if if we can do that, we have them in a sense in a box that they can't really break out. And and I I see some of that now from the like the the recent visit from the U.S. Defense Secretary and the discussion of more exercises again and so forth. But this has always been a tricky thing for I think American policymakers because that to do that in a sense means giving up on the idea of, of a, at least in the near term, of a denuclearized Korea, North Korea. And um, do you think anybody's quite yet willing to say, we're going to pull that out as a really long range objective, but in the near term, we want to have a set of negotiations where we try to put, put arms control restraints on both the capabilities and the behaviors by both sides. Do you think we've reached a point where we could do that and basically, and 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 the politicians would be able to feel they can get away with it? Or do we have yeah. to continue to uphold North, the, the, the denuclearization? I, I think that when you talk to people privately, you know, there is a clear understanding whether you talk to people on the, the political side, the security or military side, the scientific and technical side, there is a clear understanding that from any of those perspectives, that uh, given where North Korea is now in its nuclear weapons program, its missile program, it, it is going to be a, a years long, indeed, probably a decades long process to get to the state of North Korea no longer having a nuclear weapon and, and ballistic missile capability as required by UN Security Council resolutions. That is decades long. People understand that. Uh, I think you put your finger on it in terms of you know, there's a, there's a, I, I think a rather unhelpful, if I, you know, to use a diplomatic word or, or rather or empty debate about, you know, you either have to choose denuclearization or arms control. I mean, maybe, maybe you just get rid of both those words, you know, but I think that the aim, and I think it will remain, and I would agree with this, has to be no nuclear weapons on the Korean peninsula and no nuclear weapons in North Korea. And uh, you know that that has to do with the non-proliferation treaty. That has to do with our sense of just what's you know what the neighborhood needs and doesn't need in the world. Uh, but at the same time, yes, whether you call it arms control or uh, first steps or confidence-building measures, you know there ha there can and must be, and a sooner rather than later, um, some sort of process which is in the end, in the beginning going to take some pretty small steps to try to make it you know less likely that we're going to have a catastrophic you know either just accident or escalation or or use of these terrible weapons uh, i think there is an understanding of that I, I think it is a tricky thing to do as you suggest politically for us but is but i think there's a readiness to try to do that i do think there's also a sense that the north koreans just aren't there yet 
Um, and that, uh, but deterrence, and for that matter, assurance, assurance to our allies uh, and diplomacy, I mean, are not mutually exclusive. I think they have to reinforce each other. Uh, but there's no, you know, there's no quick fix that's going to be done in one congressional term or one presidential term. It's going to take some time. Well, that's uh, coming to deterrence, of course. Um, I, I, I suggested I might want to talk about this. The president of, of South Korea, President Yoon, um, made some remarks in the last few weeks about maybe the maybe the deterrence wasn't so good, or it was implied maybe deterrence wasn't so good, and that they needed to get their own nuclear weapons. Now, he he walked that back pretty quickly, but it he, he it still raised the question, you know, the, North, the South Koreans are certainly capable of building a nuclear weapon, and I think our colleague on the, on the um, PCI board, Sig Hecker, has recently written an article about the uh, consequences for for South Korea if they were to try to pursue this path. But I just think since you're watching Korea a lot, I don't know what's been the reaction in Korea after that. Has there been some, you know, uh, approbation, disapprobation? What's happened? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I would say about Sig Hecker's article, since you mentioned it, I've been recommending to all the South Koreans I know and, and everybody else, too, because I think it does lay out in, in very clear language you know, all the, if you like, I mean, unintended consequences of, of South Korea going down this path. And I think as South Koreans think those through, they understand them. And one is, among many others, is South Korea has enormous ambitions and, in fact, already capabilities to export its own civilian nuclear energy program. They just opened uh, that the same president who made the comment about about maybe we should get our own nuclear weapons was just in, in the Middle East and the UAE to open up a big uh, reactor that uh, South Korea built there and talked about South Korea's ambitions to build even more around the world and be, you know, in the top of, of, of that export industry. You know, if they started going down the nuclear weapon path, that all goes away. So I, I don't think that the, the, the argument actually is, is uh, there's scrutiny. And I think South Koreans are smart and understand that. But I think that the fact that when you do look at polling in South Korea, and if you ask South Koreans, you know, like a lot of polls, depends on how you ask the question, should South Korea get its own nuclear capability, nuclear weapons capability? The majority of people in, in some polls say yes. And yeah, they say it because they see what's happened in North Korea. They see that North Korea is threatening South Korea in a way that wasn't quite the case before. And going back to what I mentioned about Japan, there are some, sometimes they're too polite to say it to us, although they'll say it to a lot of us. Um, they're worried again about, about US reliability. So, so, and that's where I get into the assurance. I mean, it's not just deterrence, but I think we have to do a lot more assurance and it goes even beyond the security field. I mean, the South Koreans right, watch everything. You know, we passed something called the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Korea South Koreans are focused on one part of it, which um, uh, impacts very negatively on on their uh, electric vehicle exports. And consider this to be a, a lack of reassurance because they were told something else. You know, I mean, this all kind of fits into the whole relationship. So I think that the Biden administration does have a challenge to provide that political assurance as well as all the sort of sort of steps you can take for deterrence. The other thing that I think that could be more seriously considered, and I don't think I personally don't support it, but I think is 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 more a more serious proposal is the redeployment of so-called tactical nuclear weapons from the United States, US tactical to South Korea. Uh, those were there in the 1990s. They were withdrawn post-Cold War, another effort at diplomacy, and we've not had them since and, and have said that. I would hate to see us go back to, 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 to that. And I, I, I'm, I'm told that militarily it actually doesn't make sense. So it's about that assurance, but hopefully we can find some ways to, to do some assurance absent uh, further deployment of nuclear weapons or development of new ones. You know, and, as I, and just President Yoon, he's a new president never been in politics before. He's known for kind of speaking his mind, which would be a dangerous thing, you know, or, but, you know, and there's also a thought in South Korea, the final thing that, hey, you know, maybe just put that out there and get the Chinese and the Japanese others to worry a little bit. Maybe that'll help. But, you know, it's one thing, I suppose, for you or I to do that. It's not, and I'm not doing it, but it's another thing for a president to do it. So as you say, he did walk that back pretty quickly because uh, I think Washington wasn't, wasn't too happy about it. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the idea of redeploying our tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea. The good news, which you know, only a technical nerd like me 
would know is that we don't have many of those anymore. So the only ones that are are that are available are air delivered bombs. So that's mm -hmm. um, so all of the other crazy stuff that existed, you know, pre nineteen ninety two, and both both in Korea and in Europe is basically no longer in the inventory. Um, so we need to. I think it's, we want to have a chance now to hear from our audience. So um, I'm going to ask Rachel Kenderdine to come on and 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 maybe Rachel, you can start to summarize some questions from our audience. Of course, yeah. Thank you both so much, and thank you to our audience as always for sending in such great great questions. So. The first one is, do you believe North Korea would ever use their weapons for offensive purposes, or is it primarily to deter others from taking offensive action against them? Um, well, I take it seriously that Kim Jong-un um, uh, has stated I, uh, at a party congress uh, just a few months ago uh, that uh, he did not, I, I can't quote it exactly, but basically he would consider first use uh, of nuclear weapons. Um, I, I do think that, that he and the leadership will understand that, uh, the use of such a weapon would, would mean, I mean, the end of the regime, it would mean, uh, and, and in fact, uh, the United States has said that publicly, I think President Biden himself has said that, uh, but I think we have to take them seriously when they say that, but essentially I, you know, I think the, the nuclear weapons are are deterrents. They regard them as deterrents in a kind of asymmetrical world where they cannot. I mean, talk about hard power and soft power. I mean, you know, I guess North Korea is going to think of so the epitome of hard power if 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 South Korea wins in every other way because there's a certain competition between the two. Um, that uh, that it's 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 for their deterrence and it's also kind of for their legitimacy. This is what they've been able to do, uh, and you know the fact we see Kim Jong Un now out with his. His, his wife and his 10 year old daughter, you know, celebrating military day and sort of saying is sort of saying, this is this is who we are, you know, and and this is for the ages. So this is another thing that getting back to I'm going beyond the question now, but getting back to Jim's question that I think makes some of the, the, the Biden administration think, you know, he's not ready to have talks yet. He's still trying to really consolidate himself as being seen as a nuclear power in every way he can before he's ready to come to the uh, negotiating table, unless he's just under so much pressure, he has no choice. So, Our next audience member asked, I've read that much of North Korea's economy is financed by cyber theft by government actors. How does that imp impact our ability to apply meaningful sanctions on North Korea? That's a great question. Uh, and actually, if you look at, you know, applying sanctions on North Korea is not a it's not a new thing, you know. We've been doing it for decades, and without wanting to seem too sort of superficial about it, it's kind of like a game of whack-a-mole, you know. I think the North Koreans have proved to be extremely adept in in identifying new ways to obtain uh, capital uh, and to do business uh, when under sanctions. So, you know, in years past, and I mean, Jim will remember this too, it was, uh, they counterfeited really, really good $100 bills. I mean, the best ever, you know, I don't think they, they, they had their diplomats smuggling cigarettes and diplomatic pouches. This is, that's all very 20th century. Um, now, uh, uh, crypto, cyber, <laughs> um, they take, uh, you know, they take the brightest minds and they've got many as does South Korea. They take the brightest minds uh, uh, from the young people. And if they're not trained to be uh, uh, in nuclear engineers, they're trained to uh, uh, to hack. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you'll, yeah, you'll, it, it's uh, it, it makes it very, very challenging and, and means we really have to try to stay on top of it along with uh, along with the South Koreans and others. Thank you. Our next audience member asked, can you describe three major changes that have occurred in North Korea since you served as ambassador, excluding Kim Jong-un's rise to power? In North Korea? I wish you'd asked me that question about South Korea. You can say South Korea too. too. That's okay. <laughs> I will get that. Later. Um, well, I mean, let me go back and say, if you're saying in terms of my own kind of, uh, I started working again on Korea in 2005 uh, during the second term of the Bush administration uh, in Washington. And that was when the Bush administration having, uh, uh, have, having ended the, the uh, a previous Clinton administration uh, agreed, uh, agreement with 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 North Korea called the agreed framework sorry 
Um, uh, we went through a period of, of little diplomacy. I mean, and then in 2005, uh, under the Bush administration, uh, we got going with something called the Six Party Talks, with the idea that we would get a multilateral negotiation going, and um, and try to make some progress in that way. So I, getting back to what happened in North Korea, at that time when we started that, it's hard for me to think of my own, my own life. It was, you know, 2005, North Korea had not yet conducted a single nuclear test. So we were, and we were conducting these negotiations. North Korea was coming, it was under some pressure. We had a different relationship with China. So you know, we, we made some progress on it. They, they tested for the first time in 2006. So one big difference is we went from, you know, within that period, uh, a North Korea where it was kind of presumptive, right? That they were doing these things, but we didn't really know, but they never tested. We always said, that's a red line. They're Well, they crossed the red line and then they crossed it five more times. Um, and of course, they they uh, also started really ramping up on their missile program. So between then and now, you know, one huge change is they're in a wholly different place uh, in their nuclear and missile program than they were when we did the agreed framework or when we started the six party talks. The second change is, is, I think, related to, again, the relationships in the neighborhood and, and particularly with China. Um, uh, I, th I think that, uh, uh, and, and, and then Russia, if you like, as well. So if you think of North Korea as a country, you know, that's always it had, had the kind of the Cold War, during the Cold War, tried to balance, if you like, in a way between Russia and China. Uh, after the Cold War, kind of turned and tried to, you know, another approach developed as nuclear weapons. Now, now they're kind of back to something. And in fact, again, Kim Jong Un has called it a return to the the neo Cold War. He calls it. Um, that's a huge change for for North Korea. So the geopolitical things are some they, they things they feel as well as as well as we do. But the third one, I think, I would say is is the North Koreans do know a lot more about the outside world. They know a lot more. You know, they've been able to sneak in. I mean, the North Koreans, the uh, uh, USBs or whatever technology is coming, you know, with uh, South Korean dramas on it. And it turns out that South Korean dramas are a lot more uh, uh, corrupting, if you like, of, of, of North Korean values than uh, even the best of U.S. government uh, uh, broadcasts, you know. Um, so they know a lot. They, they know a lot more. And uh, and the economy in some ways, although it has uh has has become somewhat more. I, I'm not sure I call it market oriented, but but the government has lost some of its uh, ability to to manage the entire economy. They've had to kind of free things up a little bit. So so I think there are some some important elements that have changed. There may be some others too. It's a great question. I hadn't really thought about it. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, and you kind of. Oh, Jim, did you want to? Go ahead and yeah, I wanted to piggyback on that, Rachel. I think it's uh, it's. <laughs> My wife Darlene went to North Korea in, I think it was about 2006, and she was the the North Korea as you know very well. North Koreans don't want Americans to go to North Korea, except when they do, and they had opened it up for a brief period of time. And she went in with the first group, um, and um, <clears throat> when she came back, I asked her, you know, what 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 do, what's your conclusion about this place? And she said, it's a cult. If he says, drink the Kool-Aid, they're drinking it. Mm. And I wonder if you think that has changed in any way at all in the last decade and a half. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that the, yeah, I mean, I guess the honest answer is I, I, I don't know, but I do think that the, the sense of of the the Kim family, the Kim dynasty, as being the legitimate rulers of Korea, is still you know pretty deeply embedded, and and we hear this even from North Koreans who you know leave, who are defectors, you know that they really um, uh, so there. I, I think that yeah, there still is. I don't know if I call it a cult or not, but the sense of of not just one, the Kim dynasty, the Kim family, and the next generation generate the the, the Beck two bloodline, as they call it, but also kind of a sense that kind of we're poor but we're proud. You know, we're we're the uncorrupted Koreans. So I said they know a lot about the out more about the outside world. Still not say a lot than they did, including that South Korea is a heck of a lot richer and you know more fun. But there's still this kind of sense of we're the real Koreans. 
you know, I mean, notwithstanding a lot of things that like all the assistance they got from the Soviet Union and everybody else, but that we've stayed true to this. And so, and I think that's a real thing. I, so I, I guess I call that Korean nationalism, North Korean style. And I think that's very strong. So you touched on this a bit in your answer to the last question, but could you please talk some more about Chinese policy on North Korea and the Korean Peninsula generally? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, well, again, that's kind of a big subject, but um, but uh, Chinese policy on North Korea, I think, has has at, at substantial periods of time, and I'm been under you know some debate uh, within within China itself. Uh, but with Xi Jinping coming to power, with um, the downturn in U.S. Korea relations, uh, I think that China has has felt that uh, you know it it's that it it's better off kind of just trying to keep North Korea from causing too much trouble. But if it causes the US a little bit of trouble, maybe that's not such a bad thing. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I think they've gone from being just kind of irritated about the whole thing. I mean, I think it's interesting that when when Trump, you know, started his is what moved from fire and fury to, you know, the uh, uh, falling in love. Um, uh, before before Kim Jong Un ever met Trump, then he went to Beijing. It was the first time he'd gone to Beijing. It was the first time he'd met a Chinese leader since he came to power, like seven or eight years ago. So the Chinese watch. You know, they have a lot of other things they want to do, but they watch. And if they see things going in a certain direction, they kind of want to pull the string and say, "Hey, you know, we're still and you know, we're we, that border with China is very important for North Korea in terms of its oil supplies, in terms of its food, and China wants to make sure that." Things don't go so badly awry in, in North Korea that there's either political instability, if they can ensure that, and that North Korea still understands that that China is going to take a great, you know, a great interest in what goes on there. But would they prefer to see it without nuclear weapons? I mean, yeah, probably, but you know, that's not the at the top of their list. And so at this point, I think they're just, you know, kind of, uh, and 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 the relationship, the you get the China South Korea relationship as well, and that has cooled considerably. Uh, uh, over the last uh, last decade, still very important economically, of course, and much much more important. It's also much much more important economic relationship between South Korea and China than in terms of trade, in terms of than a larger relationship, I should say, than uh, with North Korea. Our next audience member also had a question about China. So they said, "How is China likely to react to the U.S. being more aggressive toward them?" both political parties in the U.S. see being tough with China as a way to strengthen our resolve as a country. Mm. How is China likely to react? Sorry. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I, I, th I, I think they've... Uh, <laughs> I'm hesitating because we, we, have, we have the balloon incident now, right? So... Um, so Jim may want to say something about that too, but uh, I, you know, I, I, again, I have to go back for a number of years. I, I think that China at various times has kind of misread the United States and, and, and we've misread China. I think that China, China after the 2008 financial collapse or financial crisis, I should say here, uh, and the global crisis thought that and we're kind of on the, you know, the U.S. is in is in terminal decline, and now's our time to be, you know, more assertive. Of course, manage the relationship. We can start to put a little more pressure on on, you know, our neighbors, uh, including Hong Kong and Taiwan, but also, you know, in Southeast Asia. Uh, that our our time is here. We don't have to hide our light, as they used to say, and bide our time. We can be a little bit more assertive. And, you know, I think what they've seen over the last few years, and we still see it as we go through COVID, you know, again, with COVID, there was this notion that, that China had done it all the right way and we'd done it all the wrong way. Now there's kind of a reassessment of that. So, you know, I think it's an ongoing, this is, this is the question of our time, is what is the US-China relationship going to be like and how do we kind of assess each other? And I think right now to say, you know, it's very challenging. And one reason it's very challenging is because we have had so little communication. I'm getting very anecdotal now, but I mean, I, I know the, 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 the US ambassador to uh, Beijing is a very experienced uh, diplomat, for example, named Nick Burns. He lives in Beijing. It's very difficult, and then for everybody at the embassy, to go anywhere, to meet anybody. You know, it's because of the COVID restrictions, but it's also because of the state of political relations. 
Uh, we have just really, it's not that I, we always had the greatest channels of communication with China, but they've really dried up a lot in the last number of years. And one thing I hope out of this, the balloon incident, is that maybe there's a recognition on both sides that we need to improve some communication ch channels just to avoid unintended escalation, unintended consequences, because we just don't, 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 we, those, those, those channels to the extent they existed have really atrophied. I mean, whether on the diplomatic or even on the, just the people to people side, you know, in terms of students, in terms of travelers, in terms of everything. And that to me is a huge challenge for us right now. Yeah, Kathy, I would just add, I mean, I think we, we can't avoid the balloon incident completely. Uh, I think the interesting, one interesting fa feature of this it, to me is that it, it raises once again questions uh, which I've heard from China scholars over the years is how much control does the leadership in Beijing really have over the, the total operation of China? And it looks like now that this program of flying balloons has been around a while and it's been, it's been run by the military and probably the military didn't tell the senior leadership, by the way, we're going to, when you're having Mr. Blinken come over here, we're going to have some balloons flying around. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and so, so the thing is blown up in their face. I mean, no, no, no pun. Literally, right. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 number of, the number of puns that are possible with a balloon incident are sort of endless. But in any case, I just think that's an interesting thing that I, I think haven't, I haven't seen commented on too much. Yeah. Rachel, absolutely. we probably have time for one more. Okay, perfect. So switching gears to Japan, this audience member asked, Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution prohibits the maintenance of war potential. How does the twofold increase in defense spending square with Article 9? Yeah. Um, I think the Japanese simply say that it does square with Article 9. <laughs> and 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 they have they have lawyers and constitutional experts who uh, who write a justification for why it squares with it. I, I think that they have continued to to you know identify ways in which they feel that without amending Article 9, which I think would be still politically quite um controversial in Japan, uh, to to move forward with this. I think if that was quick, I think we might have time for one more if that works for you all. Okay. <laughs> so this audience member asked, there has been a lot of attention given to US bases in the Philippines. Does this give comfort to Japan and Korea or might it cause concern about the diversion of bases from their countries? Uh, well, with respect to Japan, uh, my sense is the Japanese leadership and, and is, is very enthusiastic about this, that Japan itself is deepening its ties with the Philippines and uh, is pleased uh, to see the United States also strengthening that also alliance, uh, but not one that's not been as strong in recent years uh, with the Philippines. So I think they're quite enthusiastic about it. Um, and I think the South Koreans, I haven't seen a lot of commentary, but I think that, again, as a sign of, of American commitment and strengthening with alliances, I think that they would uh, also welcome it. Um, the, the, the South Koreans become concerned when they, they think that there may be some other missions or pressure on U.S. forces deployed in Korea. Uh, that might move them away from or send a signal to the north that they are no longer solely focused on the the, the threat from the north. And that's a real difference in the deployment of U.S. troops in Japan and Korea. You know, everyone understands that the ones in Japan serve a regional or indeed a global role. I'm talking again about the U.S. forces. The U.S. forces in Korea, um, from the Korean perspective, uh, are, are there for the defense of the Korean Peninsula. And when there is discussion, as there was, for example, during the Iraq War, that there that that some of these these troops might be used in a so-called more flexible way, that can become uh, uh, quite a debate between Seoul and Washington. Uh, I don't know if that will happen again, but that's going again beyond the question. But in terms of the Philippines, yeah, I think that uh, uh, our other allies welcome that. Well, okay. I think um, I don't think we have time for any more, Rachel. So we've come to the end of our webinar. So I want to thank uh, first of course Kathy Stevens for joining us from Washington, 
also thank Rachel and the rest of the staff of the World Affairs Council for what they've done to help make these these live streams so you know basically hardly flawless really it's just terrific what the what and and I guess I'm saying and thanks to Kim McCleary the president of and CEO of the World Affairs Council here in Los Angeles and Kim I'm going to turn it over to you to close it out Ambassador Stevens this was spectacular and I we learned so much we have such a uh, phenomenal audience that are lifelong learners and so fascinated and well-read about international issues and policy. And yet this was such a rich discussion. And I think we would all agree we learned so much. And Jim, you're such a phenomenal moderator and we so appreciate you bringing Ambassador Stevens to us today. So hopefully we can get you here to Los Angeles in person at some point when it's nice and warm. And not raining. <laughs> Thank you both very I much. Love that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.